Welcome to another broadcast from MindYourHealthCast.com. As you know, we do a weekly broadcast. Every Sunday we put up a new uh, video, and we've been doing that, I'm guessing, two years or so. Uh, most of them now are on YouTube. Um, probably a few didn't make it there yet that we had run on another streamer, and at some point we'll probably get those up also. As you know, we had shortened our timing a little bit. We're working on staying closer to a half hour, um, if possible. Sometimes it's hard because of the material covered, so then we end up with two sessions. At any rate, today we're going to do another review. You know, I have somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000 books in my library. Then many of them go back for years and years, and some are very ancient books, and some go back into the early 1900s and the 1800s and, and earlier. Um, much of the pertinent material related to health was available a long, long time ago. Most people think that we've made all these <clears throat> new discoveries, but the fact is, if you look backward, what you're seeing is, and it's what I'm seeing, is that we're rediscovering things that were known for a long, long time. Now, what we're going to talk about, the particular book today, has a lot to do with the mind-body relationship in health and sickness. And I have writings that go back 3,000 years uh, related to mind-body connection. So, as I say, it's really not anything new, it's just that at a certain point in history uh, we took a different turn and we kind of separated spirituality and certain aspects from the physical, and the physical went off in an ultra-physical direction, and out of that grew what we call science. Now. I've said before, when it comes to science, uh, there is true science, objective science, unbiased science, and then there is the religion of science, or Scientology, as is practiced heavily today. And then I kind of discussed the difference between the two, that scientism, or Scientology, uh, as a... Um, as a religion, and I'm not talking about the uh, Scientologist Church, which is something different, although it, they make use of some of the same principles. But the point is that there are people who claim to be scientists and utilize scientific method, but pursue any scientific endeavor, such as a research project, with a certain set of biases and exclusions as to what they cannot allow to be found or to happen, and therefore the chances of coming up with a true scientific discovery is very poor. And so when they took this direction they went very materialistic and they think only what you can see, hear, touch, and taste, uh, and feel, that's it. Nothing else uh, is pertinent. Um, Quantum physics came along and threw a wrench in the gears, but um, we're not going to get into that today. We're going to talk more about this particular book, and it is called Extraordinary Healing, The Amazing Power of Your Body's Secret Healing System. A very good book to read. As I say, I go through hundreds and thousands of books, and um, I'm looking for not only gleaning some new information for me, but I'm looking for books that I feel that are pertinent enough that you might want to read the book yourself. And um, in this book, which was written in 2005, uh, this is a doctor who has rediscovered uh, the whole concept of mind-body issues, and he refers to it as extraordinary healing. Now, the reason he does that is that in his experience he's seen people have extraordinary recoveries of things, and 
Consequently, he's implemented this into his medical practice. Now, when you read the book, as with any book, no one is ever going to agree 100% on everything that's presented in every book. Uh, I say that this gentleman does a pretty decent job of striking a balance between modern medicine, of which he's been trained and is a practitioner of, and um, integrating an understanding of the concept of what became known as psychoneuroimmunology, uh, which is the mind-body relationship. So this review is to give you some of the highlights of the book uh, and some rationale why I feel it would be worth your time to read. Now there's a lot of books that there may be so little gleanable material out of them that, um, not that I'm opposed to reading them, but if your time is limited, uh, it's good to read books that uh, can contribute something uh, significant to you. And so that's what he does because actually he divides the book into two parts. The first is introducing what he calls the secret healing system of the body which is, is very good. He's done a good job of it. And um, then in the second half of the book, he actually tells you how to implement it and he gives a lot of examples of different health issues and things that you can do to trigger or implement this healing capacity which the body has and save yourself a fortune, number one. That's, he didn't say that's why to do it, but it is true. Um, not only that, but you're going to change your outlook about your body and about health and sickness, and in so doing, I think you'll find yourself getting sick less often, and if you do get some symptoms, uh, it's not going to prompt you to immediately panic and run for help. Now, I'm not saying if something serious happens, if you fall on your head from on top of a ladder, it's probably a good idea to go to the emergency room and to get some imaging done to make sure that you haven't uh, created a big problem. But in general, if you suddenly notice that your throat is sore or you have a little fever or you've got a little ache someplace or whatever, uh, to not panic and think immediately you have to have some powerful drug to turn off those symptoms. So in the first part of the book, he, as I say, does a very good job of talking about the whole concept of your body's capabilities and then it gives you the practical application in the second half. So to me that right off is a good book to read. Now a lot of people reviewed this book and some significant people like Bernie Siegel, MD, um, Larry Payne, PhD from the International Associate of Yoga Therapists, uh, James Bonta, MD, MPH, etc., etc., visiting professor and interim chair of George Washington University, and also a person who had reviewed it was Larry Dassey, D-O-S-S-E-Y, MD, and uh, he said it's one of the most balanced, reliable health resources to come along in years. Now coming from him, that's a significant uh, statement. I met him a few years ago. He has many, many books out, all moving in the direction that we're talking about that this book is uh, elaborate on, and that is understanding what the body and mind do in conjunction with each other and how important it is to be not only aware, but able to utilize that. Now, at the beginning, he dedicates this book to someone by the name of Norman Cousins, who was born in 1915, died in 1990, um, and his surviving family members. Now, some of you may have heard of Norman Cousins, may have, many have not, he wrote a book several years ago called uh, an, the, an Anatomy of an Illness and it was about his own experience and having a significant health problem. Had he followed medicine's advice, he would have become an invalid and probably suffered a um, early death because of what 
again, the attitude is of medicine and science uh, and telling him what can't happen. So basically, um, this writer of the book, whose name is Art Brownstein, S-T-E-I-N, Brownstein, M.D., uh, knew him and uh, actually was inspired by him to begin his uh, research into this whole idea of mind-body medicine. And, and so in his early years of work as a physician, he was trained in the modern medical approach, uh, the what I call the mechanistic approach. And um, for some reason, his meeting cousins uh, inspired him tremendously to start looking in other directions. And so here's what he has to say about cousins. Um, considered healer of the medical professions and founding father of mind-body medicine, he was also a pioneering researcher and outspoken proponent of psychoneuroimmunology, a new branch of medical science that studies the interactions among the mind and nervous system and the immune system. And uh, to help us better understand how our beliefs, thoughts, feelings, and attitudes can affect our physical health. Now that's what Norman Cousins did. He was, at the time he uh, was met by Dr. Brownstein, uh, working and teaching at the U UCLA School of Medicine, Norman Cousins was. And uh, he was a big proponent of psychoneuroimmunology or the mind-body relationship. And he said Norman Cousins was the first one to make me aware of it and its p profound importance to humanity's ongoing battle against disease. And of course I kind of laugh sometimes because we always talk about fighting disease, fighting um, germs, uh, the battle of this, and we hear that someone lost the battle to cancer, and it, it always acts like it's a fight. Um, sometime we'll get more into that that whole idea, uh, fighting, wrestling, and <laughs> considering it a battle. Um, and I think this book can help you lay some foundation to get a basic understanding. Now, I need to tell you just a little bit about Norman Cousins because there's probably a lot of you who have never heard of him. Uh, he was the editor of the Saturday Review, which was a magazine that was out for years. He, he was a writer, um, and in a sense a scientist in, a, in his thinking and his background. But anyhow, he made a trip to Europe and when he returned, uh, my suspicion is that it was a very stressful trip. And when he got back, and of course you know changing the time zones add an additional stress when you do international travel. And when he got back he developed a fever and he got sicker and he visited his doctor and they put him in the hospital and it started this whole routine of, um, you know, the hospital routine you get into, which uh, Norman Cousins became very critical of and he writes about it because he, he wrote that book, uh, An Anatomy of an Illness, and part of it was about the way medicine is practiced and part of it is about the way hospitals treat patients who should be there for rest and recovery. Uh, how they constantly are interrupting them and performing all kind of tests, that there seems to be no interconnection. He was talking about the fact that in uh, one day four different departments came and drew blood from him and uh, after a couple of times of that he decided no more of that. There's no reason why they can't do one blood drawing and they can all get whatever testing they want out of the blood draw. And so he kind of began to take charge in spite of all the things that were going on. So <laughs> he said that that in itself, he considered that they're, they're disorganized in the sense that people are coming and going and running in and out. They come in and wake you up to give you a sleeping pill and just goes on and on and on. They have these routines and regimens and many times poorly coordinated. Second big critique he had was the terrible food. He said it was the worst nutritionless, tasteless food you could possibly think of, which is the last thing that somebody whose body needs all the energy and nutrients and can get to heal, that you're feeding them basically a nutritionless 
uh, imitation food processed to death and uh, in preserved with all kinds of chemical preservatives and food colorings to make it look pretty and of course not helping the patient. So th those were a couple of critiques he had about the hospital. Anyhow, bottom line, down the road after all the x-rays, the blood workups, uh, the investigations, the examinations, he was finally told he had a condition called ankylosing spondylitis, which is considered to be by medicine a um, degenerative genetic illness. I've had some experience with it in clinical experience with it and it's fairly good experience. It's not a frequent thing, but it's there. Uh, bottom line is he was told that his spine was going to totally calcify rigidly, that he would be unable to get around, he would be bound to a wheelchair, and that uh, <clears throat> they would have to have him on powerful drugs and so forth uh, to make him reasonably comfortable, but he could could figure that that was it as far as his life was concerned. He was going to be uh, immobilized and bound to a wheelchair. Now, the average person would do what? They would say, oh, okay, and allow everything to be done to them that medicine would do. And of course, since they considered it genetic, they did not consider that there was a way to treat it. Therefore, uh, they decided that, um, and have over the years, just made it a management issue. You manage the symptoms that occur as best you can and you provide the best wheelchairs and the best uh, <laughs> devices and so forth, uh, but forget it, you know, you can't do anything about it. Now he was not particularly interested or ready to accept that. Now I'm taking some time to talk about Cousins because in a sense he sets the theme for the book uh, because after this whole experience Cousins went on to be recognized by medicine and the medical, at least one medical school, hired him to teach as a result of what he did with his issue. So he didn't accept the fact that he was going to be totally immobilized. He did not expect, accept the fact that his spine was going to be totally calcified into a rigid bar and therefore he would not be able to walk, he would be stuck in a wheelchair. He didn't accept any of that. So what he did is he got together with his doctor and said, I want out of here. There's nothing you can do for me here. I want to start working on my own plan. I would like you to cooperate with me. And if you would, that would be fine. If not, then I'm sure he told him I'll be happy to find another doctor. So he had done a lot of reading, you know. He's, he's not a person who would just take a pronouncement of finality lying down, he would look into it. So his agreement with his doctor was he was leaving there, he was going to check into a motel or hotel room away from everybody else, he was going to change his diet, he did a lot of study on vitamin C, he wanted to have IVs of vitamin C by the doctor, that was the doctor's part. He had a, um, an associate who he sent out to rent or buy every humorous movie or video that he could find. Now this would be back in the 1960s, so probably more movies and maybe some early videos. I don't recall exactly when the heavy video market developed, but anyhow, this is back in the 60s. And so in the hotel room, every day, all day, he took IVs of vitamin C, significant levels, and he watched humorous movies and thought of nothing otherwise. In other words, he didn't think about his health problem, he didn't worry about anything else was going on. In his mind, he was creating an atmosphere of levity and healing, and every day he laughed all day at all these different uh, movies and videos he was watching. 
And uh, lo and behold, he got well. Now here's a man who's told you have a genetic illness that, sorry, it, uh, it, there's no cure. Um, and I'm sure in the doctor's experience who told him that, that number one, that's what he had taught, number two, that's what he expected, and number three, that's what he saw in the people he dealt with. So, um, Norman Cousins did not accept it. He chose his own path. He asked about the doctor to cooperate with him if he would, but if not, he was going to go his own way regardless, and he did. So, as I say, his recovery was so significant that he was hired by a medical school to teach the psychological side of illness. And he did a tremendous amount. He wrote some other books. So if you, you want to go back and look at Norman Cousins' An Anatomy of an Illness, and then some of the other books he wrote, uh, you'll find that he was heavy into psychoneuroimmunology. Now it's been expanded in recent years to psychoneuroendocrinoimmunology, which means not only is the mind and nervous system interconnected with the immune system. It's connected with the endocrine system, which are all the hormonal systems in the body, so that all of those are governed by what you think, ultimately. In other words, you can think yourself sick, you can think yourself well. Now, I'll give you as much as I have time for a few comments that he makes. Uh, in this book, because it, as I say, it's really a good book to get started. He stays in regular medicine, and he I'm sure he does a lot of the regular medical things. Um, he does not work the way I would work, but that's okay. What he does is still much better than what you normally get when you go, and every time you go what you get is another drug, uh, and all drugs highly suppressive with tremendous adverse effects. So here's what he says, your body is an incredible creation. No other machine is like it in the world. For the most part, it's designed to last for about a hundred years and it can repair and heal itself from a whole host of injuries, traumas, illnesses, and diseases. It can do this because, in addition to the other systems of the body, it has a healing system. A system so powerful and efficient, so subtle and dynamic, and yet so obvious that it has been largely taken for granted and overlooked by most of modern science. Now, that's a pretty powerful statement, and but yet true. And he says, as a result, despite its supreme importance, your healing system remains the least studied, the least understood, and the least well-known of all your body systems. And so he goes on to quote Hippocrates, who is considered the father of Western medicine, who declared, natural forces within us are the true healers of disease. And of course, disease in the true sense, dis-ease, meaning not at ease. And Norman Cousins, the famous author healer, first spoke of, to me, he said, at UCLA. In this book, I share basic information about your healing system. I also provide simple yet effective, time-honored, scientifically valid, practical strategies, exercises, techniques, and methods to help you take advantage of your natural internal healing resources. So I mentioned to that, the first part of the book, he lays out the whole idea, and then the second part of the book, he then gives you practical application of things you can do, and he lists a whole lot of different issues and problems that people have and things you can do. So he actually get, offers you a program, in a sense, to become your own healer in most cases. Now he says in the first chapter, the energy or life force, as it is often referred to, expresses itself as vitality or aliveness. In human beings, this vitality or aliveness expresses itself as a natural state of health. Now he's saying that that is really the natural state. In fact, he has a portion of that first chapter called Health is Natural and Normal, Disease is Unnatural and Abnormal. So he says, health is your body's fundamental 
natural state. Health is programmed into the DNA of every one of your cells as it is programmed into the DNA of the cells of every human being. In fact, if you were to conduct a simple experiment by leaving your body to its own devices, supplying it with just a few basic necessities, you would discover that for the most part it can main, remain healthy all on its own with very little interference or intervention. I think that's a pretty powerful statement and <laughs> he also says, when you become ill and lose your health, you lose your feeling of ease and you become afflicted with dis-ease. Understood in these terms, disease represents nothing more than a temporary departure from your natural state of health. He also spends time talking about listening to your body. As I've already mentioned, illness and disease occur when your body's internal environment has become imbalanced and disoriented. This is usually the result of nature's basic laws of health being knowingly or unknowingly violated. Your body continually provides you with clear, updated information relayed directly from a precise, highly intelligent early warning system designed to inform you when you are in the danger of being or of losing your health. Um, very good material, um, good thing to read and really digest that first part of this book. And uh, I'm reading some sections because he says it so well that it's really hard for me to elaborate on it and say it any better. And here he talks about, about his own work. Many people come into my office blaming another family member or the person sitting next to them on the airplane for the bronchitis or throat infection they contracted. Their attitude is only natural. However, because of the ubiquity of bacteria, viruses, and other organisms in our immediate environment and in the air we breathe, these microorganisms in and of themselves are usually not the only cause of illness. In fact, many cases is not the cause at all. If you were all, you were, all of us would be, if they were, all of us would be sick all the time. Again, yeah. I've said this to patients before, every day we breathe in anywhere from dozens to a hundred or two hundred viruses, uh, all kinds of toxins and so forth. If just being exposed to, quote, a virus we're going to make you sick, everybody would be sick all the time. And of course that's not so. Also if germs were spread from person to person so easily then doctors who spend every day around these germs and around the people who spread these germs should be the sickest people of all, but they are not now. <laughs> Sometimes they are, but uh, in general, I mean, they're not disabled because of all that's going on. Under normal conditions, bacteria and viruses in our environment usually do not bother us in the least. Very important statement, I've said that before and not too many people like to believe it because we were raised on the germ theory of disease. These germs attack us and make us sick and we have to come up with weapons to defeat them, getting back to the battle idea that I've talked about earlier. For as previous medical research attributed more importance to the virulence or virulence of such agents as bacteria and viruses that cause the diseases, newer medical research places much greater emphasis on host resistance. Now what does that mean? That means your a body's ability to take care of itself. We can think of the host resistance factors as the body's internal healing resources. Now there's a lot more heavy material I could give you from what he says in here, uh, but he goes into some explanation which is worthwhile for you to understand uh, as to how the body implements this system to deal with all these things that are going on. And so he makes a list of some of these things, but we're not going to have time to read all those. But just to give you an idea, your healing system can expand and contract blood vessels to increase blood flow to specific areas of your body that need healing. Now that's true, the body can shut down blood to one area and push more to another area. It does this all automatically and we don't even have to pay attention to it. It can speed up your heart rate, increase the strength of its contractions to rapidly deliver more blood, oxygen, and nutrients to specific sites that need healing. Um, it stimulates the glands to produce key hormones that are needed. It can increase body temperature to cause a fever, induce sweating, to remove toxins, and of course viruses tend to fall apart as they get heated hotter. 
Your healing system can modify the function of your kidneys to reduce urine output and conserve water if you're getting dehydrated. It can supervise the amazing process of bone remodeling or knitting your bones together as it heals fractures. It can increase your breathing rate and lung capacity to bring in more oxygen for your cells and tissues when needed. So that's just some of the ways that the body does its job. Uh, it says the body's healing system has been overlooked until now for a number of reasons. The primary reason is that conventional medicine, medical science focuses for the most part on the structure and form of the body rather than its function or how the body works. This view has an impact on medicine in some significant ways. We won't even have time to read those, but you should definitely read this. These are things that I tell patients all the time that modern medicine does not spend much time in training doctors to understand how the body functions. We've gone to the, this for that system. You got this symptom, you take that drug. This thing is going on, take that. All of those medications are aimed at doing what? They're aimed at turning off symptoms. Are they making you well? No. Do they make you feel better? Yes, temporarily. What are the implications of that? In the long run, what happens is that you pay a lot of money to buy temporary relief of symptoms at the expense of your health. Because if you turn off the symptoms, the problem is still there. It tends to go deeper. The Chinese discovered that thousands of years ago. The problem goes deeper into the body, and as it goes deeper into the body, then of course you've got a big problem. and. Um, what do you get then when it goes deeper in the body? You get a new set of symptoms. You think you've gotten a new problem. It's the same old problem gone deeper. You paid a lot of money to make yourself sicker. Now you're going to pay more money to get more powerful things because now the problem is worse. And what ultimately happens is you move from a functional disorder to a pathological disorder by not allowing the body to do its job. Now, if you have questions about all that, you should go back and look at my broadcast on homotoxicology, which explains how we get sick and how we get well. But he's doing a good job of talking about the whole concept in this book and doing it in a very way, very non-technical, but giving you good information. It was written for the average person to kind of grasp the concepts without getting too technical. And he does what I always t tell people, symptoms, sneezing, coughing, diarrhea, fainting, fever, nausea, pus, runny nose, nasal congestion, swelling and redness, tearing of the eyes, vomiting. All those are symptoms of the body trying to take care of an issue. And you've got two, well actually three choices. Number one is you do nothing, allow the body to do its job. Number two, if you want to speed it up, you can do some natural therapies that help the body do it faster. Number three, you can take a drug that turns off the symptoms but allows to remain in the body whatever the body was trying to get rid of. Now when it comes to vomiting, uh, just keep this in mind. I'm just going to take one of all these issues he mentions. Vomiting is a protective mechanism that your healing system uses to eliminate contaminated or noxious material that has somehow entered into your stomach and small intestines. Vomiting is a fast, efficient, and powerful way for your body to rid itself of toxins or other harmful substances. After you've eaten contaminated food, as in food poisoning, vomiting will occur to expel infectious organisms as well as unwanted food and toxins. People use the report feeling much better after they have vomited in these instances. If you have overeaten, eaten foods that are too rich, or drunk too much coffee or alcohol, which act as intestinal irritants and toxins when they're taken in excess, vomiting will occur to clean out and reduce the burden on the digestive system and the body. Uh, and then, of course, he has a whole chart, the benefits of recognizing your healing system's responses. In other words, understand what's going on and don't think you need a pill to get rid of it. And that's what's happened with modern medicine, unfortunately, is that they've developed a pill for every symptom or a shot or whatever, and it does, in many cases, relieve the symptoms. So if vomiting is what your body is doing 
which is a natural maneuver to get rid of something extremely toxic, and you turn off the vomiting mechanism by shutting down the vagus nerve that triggers the vomiting reflex, what happens to the poison you've ingested? Your body gets poisoned from it because you've stopped the process. Same thing with diarrhea, though both of those are very significant when it comes to getting rid. Mucus production is getting rid of toxic material out of the body. If you take a uh, antihistamine and decongestant, you stop the process of your body getting rid of the toxins related to, in this case, uh, say a virus, or you've eaten something that has triggered the release of mucus, which is a way of carrying the poisons out of the body. So just so you kind of get an understanding, and as I say, this book is written in such a way for the average person that you should glean a lot out of it. Remember it's called Extraordinary Healing, The Amazing Power of Your Body's Secret Healing System. The author is Art Brownstein, MD. Written in 2005, you can go to Amazon and pick it up. Um, extremely good basic course and how your body gets sick and how it gets well and understanding the real meaning of symptoms and as I said the last part of the book the second half is giving you a lot of tools that you can learn to take care of yourself. I see by the big clock on the wall that our time has expired again. I hope I've given you enough provocation to um, purchase the book and read it and I think you'll get a good basic education and then after you've read the book I would go to YouTube to my video on homotoxicology and see that we're going into a little bit more depth than what he's talking about here but if you've read this first you're already going to have a general understanding and then it will all make sense. It was nice being with you again. I hope we've given you something to arouse your curiosity and to stimulate you to think more in terms of health. Now he does talk a lot in this book about diet too and there was just no time to get to that part of it but he does stress how important it is. I don't recall that he is so big on organic nutrient rich or dense food versus standard uh, produce food that may come from very poor soil, but at any rate that's another subject and we've talked about that before and we'll probably not talk about it again to make it clear about the, the food issue which is another major one. We did talk recently about the GMO idea, uh, how the genetically modified food is has tremendous health implications. But at any rate, it, it is a good read and it will enhance your education about your body and about how you can participate in your own health. It was nice being with you again. Go to our website, mindyourhealthcast.com and you can link from there to Alternative Health and Prevention website. And you'll notice if you peruse through the pages, there are pages of important information about various aspects of things that I feel are important for health. And otherwise, we'll look forward to seeing you again at the next broadcast. In the meantime, be healthy.